as, um, as my um, introducer already said, I'm Georgiana. I'm originally from Romania, but I lived in a lot of places, including London, Amsterdam, a lot of places in Romania. I also have a um, six-year-old kid, and uh, I've been doing enterprise scale PHP for, I don't know, 17 years. Lately, I've been cheating and doing more Python, but a few years ago, I even organized Romania PHP, which was um, an amazing adventure, I would say. I didn't even organize my own wedding, so I was uh, faced with this thing, let's organize a conference, because why not? So that was a very uh, fun thing to do. Uh, when I don't play with my kid, I don't do PHP or Python or uh, conferences. I um, am trying to uh, complete my PhD um, studies. I'm trying to do um, systems engineering with machine learning. Quite an interesting topic. Let's grab a cup of tea later if you want to hear more. One year and a half ago, I moved in uh, Brabant, which is a historical province um, south of the Netherlands. In Eindhoven, it's a very, very big uh, technical hub. And I'm working for uh, ASML, which is one of the largest companies in the world. So we have around 24,000 colleagues, out of which 12,000 are located in um, Eindhoven. What we do is produce machines that um, Intel, Samsung, and any other manufacturer is using to make chips and memories for all the devices that you already have in your pockets or on your laps in some cases. So what we do there is change the world one nanometer at a time. That's our measurement unit. But today, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the project that is uh, very dear to my heart, which is um, solving this kind of problem. So before CICD, uh, completely automated was a thing. Um, our teams were um, interacting on a human level with a lot of questions. Yeah? So the project manager would ask, hey, what's the status? Are we good for the next release? And then the QA team would go to the developers and ask them, do you have anything for me to test? Ah. And then, uh, can you install it somewhere? Yeah, th these kind of things. In some companies and some groups, this is still the case. Yeah? So um, that is why. Um, we, um, many, many, many years and projects ago, in 2012, actually decided to use Skype. We found this Sevabot um, tool that would allow us, um, you could hook it as a participant in a group conversation, and then you would have like a keyword that you put uh, in the beginning after the exclamation mark, and that one would be your bot, and then these are the commands. So in this case, discover all environments would give us the staging, development, QA, and so on. And then um, this is a naming convention that we used for scaling. You can see here um, uh, the 12, meaning how many uh, elastic items you will have. And you would say, just provision it, put the latest stuff in there. Yeah? So th this was actually um, very, very uh, easy to do from a chatbot point of view. You would just go as a project manager in Skype and start typing all these things, which was not very funny. But mm, it would take the burden of answering these kind of questions um, to the QA or the PM department. And um, mm, what I can also uh, show you here is uh, versioning and uh, installation done automatically. So you would trigger this one, you would have a hook, and um, <coughs> just use it. So if you go uh, and search on GitHub, this still exists as a code base. Of course, Microsoft acquired Skype and started to kill all the good features about it. So for um, one year, I think, we didn't upgrade our Skypes because uh, we had this chatbot uh, up and running. So we were like one year behind. So. What I'm going to show you today, a small introduction in chatbots. I will uh, showcase a little bit um, on the technical side of journey, and if time allows, we will do a demo. But I want to start with the show of hands. Who has written a chatbot that is being used more or less in production by others? 
Okay, two people, very nice. So this is a very hooky audience, right? So I will insist uh, more on the first part. Um, are your chatbots technical or uh, no? Yeah? Hmm? Okay, thank you. So for those who haven't written any chatbots yet, let's learn a little bit of history. When did the first chatbot actually appear? A very long time ago, 1966. It was called ELISA, and it appeared at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. They were using regular expressions, pattern matching, to identify certain things and mimic understanding. Much, much later, 1993, this is also before I started programming, so quite a while ago, um, in IRC, Mm, you, you know, uh, Slack is uh, written on top of IRC, but the original IRC, right? Uh, somebody wrote a couple of uh, TCL scripts and C code modules and so on, so a complex thing to do user management, channel management, game stats, and all sorts of things. In 2001, have you ever heard of Smarty Child? Of course, because this was a chatbot that was written for the AOL instant messaging platform, which died successfully <laughs> a long time ago. But this is the actual chatbot that um, resembles what we are used to get today. So if we want to uh, look a little bit at what other people are doing, I suggest to start with bot directories. Bot list, or there is a bot for that dot com, or chat bottle, you would go there and see categories of chatbots, and some of them um, allow you to start interacting with them directly. So th this is a good starting point to get the feeling of uh, what people are building. My uh, current employer is an on-prem shop, therefore I will uh, always come up with this kind of slides. Today, if you want to do a cloud-based uh, chatbot, you have quite a um, good shopping list. IBM offers Watson Assistant. Google has Dialogflow. <coughs> Microsoft has the bot framework and the uh, uh, engine that uh, recognizes, does NLU, um, you know, which is called Louis. Facebook acquired Wit.ai. So when I first started uh, doing this, Wit.ai was a small independent thing, not yet purchased by the big guys. And Amazon uh, has on uh, in AWS something called Lex. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah? So Lex is um, quite connected with Alexa, uses some of those uh, things, and also allows you voice interaction, which is a bit more modern. I must say, I tried to change this particular demo using Lex, and it took more than two days. So I consider the training part to be more complex than the Watson that I will show you later. If you are um, happily living on-prem with your code bases, you have perhaps uh, very secure data that must not leave uh, uh, your prems, you can still install Watson Assistant there, which is very nice. It's a pre-trained model. It's the best one that you uh, can do as a starting point. There is a company in Berlin, a startup called Rasa, which um, was the first one to actually productize um, an on-prem uh, bot. They have two components, the chatting part and the natural language processing part. Again, uh, just like for Lex, the um, NLP part, you need to train it really well. I did deliver one bot for, um, for a company here in London, uh, Formula One team, and the training part for Rasa took quite a solid week, I would say. Yeah. So mm, I'm just trying to uh, show you that a lot of investment needs to be spent in this part. So my recommendation is to start with one of the cloud-based solutions and then slowly move if you need uh, to go on-prem. 
what Rasa does have is uh, you can do a Watson um, chatbot and then you can export it and import it into Rasa so you don't need to uh, start from scratch. So th these two guys uh, work really well together. SNPs is the um, on-prem for voice. Really check it out. It works on your phone. It works uh, anywhere you need it offline. SNPs is the tool for you if you want voice. Now, because this kind of audience didn't really build chatbots, I will start with a bird eye view on what pieces you would need. Let's say um, you have a consumer that needs to uh, interact with your chatbot. They will need to go to a conversational interface to actually input their queries and get the uh, output from it. And you would need like a more complicated part to do processing. Now, uh, in the conversational interface, you would have the entry point, let's say Slack, Twitter, I will use it later in the example, but there are uh, Telegram and Facebook Messenger and whatnot, and a bot framework. Why uh, is the bot framework part important? Because it uh, completely abstracts the um, entry point from the actual communication. And we will talk about it uh, a little bit later. On the processing part, Whatever the person input in the um, entry point, we want to understand what they're doing, which is the NLU part, and then we want to tap into the knowledge base and actually do the job. So if we uh, go and um, start doing it in more depth, mm, on the left-hand side, you could see the entry points, like Slack, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. That does nothing for you other than allows you to um, type in text and uh, get messages back. Botmaster is the part that abstracts all these formats because, of course, the JSON that comes from Slack is completely different from the one that comes from uh, Twitter and completely different from the one that comes from Telegram, which is why a bot framework is a solid choice it, at this point. It completely cleans the entire pipeline for you. <coughs> and one word of advice, Botmaster, which we use for Johnny, exists, the code is there, but uh, the project is not really maintained anymore. Um, if I would start right now, I would um, go for the um, Microsoft solution, and I'm not proud to say I would go for the Microsoft solution, but the bot framework seems to be the best one because it's uh, not only uh, a good um, abstraction for these things, but also interacts with Skype particularly. So that, that is one of the reasons. Um, Skype is not yet dead, so that would be my advice. Now for Botmaster, which again, uh, we still use, this was the good part about it. It allowed you to do a Facebook Messenger, Slack, any socket IO interaction, which we specifically used for monitoring dashboards. So we would trigger queries in uh, Slack and we would update certain dashboards using socket IO. Again, Twitter and Telegram. So go for go shopping for a bot framework. Not bot master, unfortunately. So you can see how easy it is. You create the bot, and then you just add um, the various interactions that you need here, which means that either of these channels um, sends a message, you, you get them centralized in uh, one place, which is very, very nice. Now. If Botmaster is just a mediator of these channels, we need some powerful thing, which is the brains. And the brains is the part that we do in PHP, because we all love PHP. But the brains, uh, the orchestration part, doesn't really understand what the customer is saying, which is why we need a natural language understanding platform to help us with that. As I said before, there are multiple alternatives that you can try. The market leader is Watson, and um, it's the one that uses uh, the best uh, pre-trained model. Yeah? Does anybody know Watson? Where does the name come from? A detective, maybe? No? 
there was a guy called Thomas Watson, which was the first CEO of IBM, and they used uh, his name to um, designate the entire umbrella of AI technologies that they offer. So this guy was a teacher, and uh, he just gave up and decided, yeah, let's take a course in accounting and uh, do business. Uh, he was a bookkeeper, yeah? So that Watson, not detective and other things. Today, if you want to search for documentation, you have to search for Watson Assistant. But before it was called Watson Assistant, it was called Watson Conversation. So you might find very good tutorials under the previous name. And when it was first launched, of course, it had a completely different name. It was Watson Dialog. So don't be confused. It is the same product that evolved over time. It does have a free tire. You can really, really play with it. And even if you move into the paid tire, it's uh, not very expensive. If I'm not mistaken, the free tire allows you like 10,000 um, NLU calls more than enough to uh, bootstart and even use in your team, right? The Watson umbrella offers a lot more products. For example, if you want to do really, really advanced NLU, you might want to move into studio and other things. So that is why, um, uh, like another reason for which Watson is a good uh, point to start. So did you get bored with all the technical introduction part? Not really. If we move into the more uh, fun part, Johnny, let's try to break it down a little bit. I don't really like sequence diagrams, but I understand people resonate with them better than any other kind of diagram, so here we go. We have a teammate trying to communicate with our bot. We have the um, uh, Botmaster framework. We have our PHP brains that connects everything together um, by communicating with Watson and in our case, Jenkins for uh, the build. So I want to ask a question and receive an answer. Let's see what happens in between. The bot master will try to uh, figure out meeting, meaning by asking the brains that is um, going to uh, give us that answer. Now, um, the NLU part is, okay, whatever question was uh, placed, do you have an idea what it means? Can you please um, break it down for me? The language for NLU uh, is intent and entities. So what was the user intention? And entities, what are the topics that we can extract from that sentence that uh, was asked in the chat? Once we are uh, sure of the intent, we can go and operate uh, on our knowledge base. In this case, Jenkins, Jira, or anything else. Now, the intent can be recognized by Watson in this case uh, with a certain threshold of certitude. What you can do is say, okay, if the certitude is less than um, 0 0.8, which is like 80%, it means um, the NLU engine is not really sure it figured out what you tried to say. And then you can, um, instead of going and operating on the knowledge base, you can come back and ask for clarifications and more things. So going away from the sequence diagram into like a normal uh, flow, you can see that um, we have the entry points the knowledge base, everything else is the bot, yeah? So the bot is multiple components. Just to make sure we can see it, yeah? So let's move to the first one, entry points. I have some slides explaining how to set up in Slack because we're all technical, we want to go out with a, something that works. So. In Slack, you have to make a Slack application in the uh, API online. You have to choose the organization. And this one will give you authorization tokens and bot user auth token. These two are different, yeah? And then 
you will go and subscribe to events. You can uh, say, okay, I only want messages, I want group messages, I want, so um, Slack allows you to uh, split it down. And you have to provide the URL of your bot. In this case, I um, used ngrok. Do you know what ngrok is? Yeah, so you see, people doing chatbots. If you want to work locally, because we are developers, first, first we want to test it, not just put it in the cloud. Uh, ngrok allows you to uh, create a tunnel from your machine to an endpoint on the internet and use that endpoint um, uh, in your bot. In this case, I have a prefix, you can see here, Johnny Bot. This means I'm using the paid plan. If you use the free tire, which is perfectly fine, you will have a number that gets changed every time you restart the tunnel. You can keep the tunnel open for weeks, like uh, sometimes we do, or you can um, move on to the paid version and uh, use uh, the same name, and then you don't have to come here and update it too often. I just wanted to show you that this is a manual process that you will need to do. So, the, uh, in Slack in particular, you can see um, if somebody sends a personal message to the bot, it can react or it can react to a certain group conversation or to channels, yeah? Maybe pick your poison here. In the beginning, you will probably talk to the bot uh, all by yourself, and with time, you will move to the next levels. The next component is the mediator, uh, the bot master part in here for the Slack setup. Yeah, so in, we can do multiple setups. I'm outlining the Slack one. You grab from the online Slack uh, the team identifier. This is your uh, Johnny bot user identifier. Uh, no, this is uh, the team identifier and the bot ID with the authorization token. If you remember from the previous slide, you had two access tokens, one for the organization and one for the bot. So that's why you need both from, from that screen. Now here it's um, the piece of JavaScript code that uh, shows you how to set up Slack. It's not very complicated, you just need to uh, say okay, which one of these is the webhook endpoint? And I will go back because I want to show you. It's this part. So uh, your endpoint, uh, your uh, domain of the bot, and then uh, Slack. And then this part is the webhook that uh, you are calling. Yeah, everything else is fixed. And the credentials. Now, um, in the mediator, you have incoming and outgoing. So what you do here is the middleware uh, incoming from Slack, I decide to um, make sure that the bot doesn't talk to itself, yeah? Because if um, the Slack bot user ID is exactly the same one coming from the event, the bot will get into an infinite loop. It will try to talk to itself, it's not, not very funny. Uh, and then we just prepare request options and we pass them forward to the brain. Very straightforward. But um, you can see that you, uh, in here, the Slack incoming middleware can be completely separated or can be the same as the Twitter one or any other um, uh, platform. So this is like the part where you decide how your bot is going to react. React to all channels the same or uh, not. And then you have exactly the same for outgoing, yeah? So you can very finely grained configure how your bot behaves on every single uh, entry point. Okay, PHP time. This is a very, very skinny uh, Symfony application because uh, I love Symfony more than Laravel. Any. Uh, Laravel lovers here? Yeah, any Symfony lovers here? Thank you, more enterprise people, so my, my demo is quite good. <laughs> you can see it's very easy. Um, you know, we don't have like a um, full-fledged application, a conversational controller, and then these entities are uh, automatically mapped with the GMS serializer from the JSON into an object, yeah? So you... Um, put them in this small way. So let's see how, um, how we do it. 
Um, we just received that text thing from um, uh, JavaScript, from the uh, bot master part. We deserialize it directly into this entity. Um, we know it was a JSON incoming. So now we can look into the API request and see no message, no response. Okay, so defensive programming first. Now we can focus on the interesting part. Um, I made a, a small service called ask, which is the part where, okay, now I want to go to the NLU. What's in this case? Just ask um, this question. For demo purposes, we also log it because we want to have a look at it. And then um, we send it back. Now, if you, you can see here in the um, response that we got here from uh, Watson, we don't have any intents. It means the uh, NLU engine didn't figure out any kind of meaning in the text that was being said. If we do have intents, we can iterate over them. Please, in production, do not use switch and case. Use normal injection, yes. This is not something that you want to take home for uh, usage in production, yeah, because your employer will not like it, but it's much easier to fit it on a slide like this. So if the first intent is, okay, tell me how many tickets you have ready for QA, do this thing. If you want to me to prepare a release candidate and deploy it, um, pick these two uh, items that were identified by the NLU engine and uh, send them as parameters to the corresponding job. If you want to ask historical questions, what happened, when was something last um, performed, like an update or um, something else, then we're going to do uh, this third action. How do we interact with Watson? Even easier, we have a ready-made request. We place a string uh, in the constructor. It will make all the rest for us with all the environmental variables that are required. <coughs> we'll serialize it as a JSON and uh, give it to the Watson uh, client to post it. Super easy. APIs, one-on-one. -on -one. And then we get back a body that we uh, respectively deserialize in the response entity. Okay, so the PHP part was just gluing things together and then uh, that way you can see, yeah, do I trust this from the NLU and so on. Let's see, um, how do we uh, do the NLU setup? Uh, as I said, this thing changed like a million times in the naming, in UIs, you will find all sorts of stuff. Nowadays it's called assistant and an assistant can have one or multiple skills. So this is your actual and natural language understanding part. You can see, um, I, I'm actually keeping this screenshot from a, a while back because this was a, an example for a customer care uh, chatbot and you can see how few examples are fed here. Yeah. So mm, the examples that are given are just free text things and then you say, okay, I want, uh, I don't know, find business hours. So they give 38 possible ways in which a person can ask about business hours or chatbot. But if they want to say goodbye, they only give like uh, six alternatives. <coughs> if you want to make an appointment, they didn't need more than 19. Yeah? So this is the part where you train your bot. In Watson, you, uh, the numbers are quite small. In the other ones who don't have such a good pre-trained model, you will need a lot more. So th this is why I'm keeping this slide, because these numbers, if you think maintaining uh, 47 examples is easy for this one, I can guarantee you that in the other platforms you will need to provide more alternatives so that the training is uh, improving. The newer interface, yeah, so that, that one, the old one, I keep it for uh, that kind of explanation. You can see with um, five, six examples, we can do um, uh, this kind of um, understanding. So, what is involved here? Intent are the things that, um, as I said before, do we uh, recognize what the person is asking from us? And it's one of uh, these things, or you can have multiple, like in the previous example. This is our, what our bot knows what to do. 
And then entities, which are of two types, um, user-defined, called my entities, and the system ones. The system ones uh, can detect uh, time ranges, locations, all sorts of things. The system entities used by the Facebook with AI are better. Yeah, so that, that's where you uh, get confused. Um, there are fewer in Watson, so it doesn't understand like everything, but it allows you uh, to create uh, better uh, user-defined ones. So you can see here that in the environment, I have like uh, my keywords. This is what I'm going to pass as parameterized uh, items to Jenkins. By the way, we upgraded to Circle CI, but don't tell anyone. Um, so you can see here, yeah? I'm, when I'm saying dev or development is the same thing. Um, if uh, I want to use production, it will be like prod, production, live, whatever you want to say. This is how the, uh, it recognizes the entities. The intents are comprised of various uh, entities and combinations of those into a sentence. Yeah? So you have uh, code that you can play with. Uh, you have a video tutorial, how to set up Jira, and online a demo video, but I will do something better if time allows. We have some more time. I will uh, show you a couple of pre-recorded videos just to uh, show you how all these complicated things work together. Remember, it's not complicated. A person interacts with the conversational interface. We already know the conversational interface has two components. And we do a processing part, which has two different components, our brains and the NLU engine. Yeah? OK, let's try to. Let's show you the first one. So the first intent is ready for QA. The text that's been written here is saying, do you have tickets ready for QA? And you see here the dockerized version of Jira that um, I prepared. So you can see in this column, there is nothing. So now I just move the ticket, yeah, I'm done. And now I'm going to ask a different, uh, with a different wording, are there issues ready for testing? Okay, it found one. I can even click it if I craft my response correctly so that it provides the link. I'm just going to skip uh, and move both of them. What? The kids? Are this was me learning how to do a proper demo, are ready for testing probably, yeah. But you can see tickets and JIRAs and all sorts of slang that we use. This was not provided with synonyms. We provided it in the five or six examples uh, of the sentence. And of course it found both of them, yeah. Okay. The next example is this one, more complicated. And um, I also want to show you that in the Watson conversation, you can try it out here. So this is where you train it. And then, um, <laughs> so you don't go through the whole component setup if you don't need to. Okay, I'm going to do something really hacky. I found a tool that completely deletes uh, Slack history Please don't delete your company's Slack like, history like this. <laughs> but it can be done. <laughs> okay, and um, I'm just going to copy paste some text. This is not in the right place. I need you to build an RC for the CMS and deploy it to QA. And you see here, I need you to deploy to integration. 
I did not specify I need you to build an RC because that one is in another training sentence. So what I'm typing here is not the same thing that I did for training. It are completely different things. And you see it started the build and it passed on to variables, an environment and a component that were identified um, from, uh, from the NLU engine build a new release candidate of the front end and deploy it to integration. A refresh shows we have a next build with two parameters. The environment is integration and the component is front end. This one. another one and um, in this particular Jenkins instance which is um, uh, for a demo purpose I have a random thing that uh, fails the builds once in a while yeah because in real life not everything is green so you see this one is, is marked as a failure or something prepare an API build and deploy it to production. Again, two actions. Okay, so now that we created history in Jenkins, who here you still uses Jenkins? Yes, yes. How easy it is to find anything there in the history? Not very, right? So th this is one of the reasons for which I made this thing. There were many frustrations, but this was one of them. So finding out things in a parameterized uh, log, you have like hundreds of builds. You can never find anything. So this one is telling me, um, tell me when the website was like de last deployed in staging. And it will go, use the API of Jenkins, scrape it, and uh, find the result and put the link in uh, Slack. Okay, this is the part where uh, we take the mm, debugging uh, part. This is what Watson said. And we're going to have a look at it, beautify it. You can see it has a degree of confidence of 92%. So we can really make this action. There are other uh, cases when the confidence level uh, we found like uh, 50, 60%, and then we keep on asking questions. Yeah, so th this is a nicer way to scrape your Jenkins history. Okay, so this is the uh, example that is not so confident. Let's see. You see, it's like 0 0.54, 54%. Mm. We wouldn't really want to execute this if it was an action. You can find this one uh, on YouTube, 